at the age of 20 years old, I was a drunk, alcoholic, drug addict who badly abused the system, went to jail, falsely made up a story about a newspaper account of a murder, was then lied on by police, charged with this murder, convicted of this rape and murder, sentenced to die, and was put in solitary confinement for 23 years in Pennsylvania's death row. While I was there, I contracted hepatitis C from the beating that they gave me in which they broke my teeth and things like that, and the dentist infected me. I became so sick with this virus in my system, I asked to be executed in 2002. And in 2003, DNA's results finally granted to me, proved that I wasn't the person who committed the rape and murder. And then finally in 2004, two years after that effort started, I was set free. Okay, well, joining me today on the Freedom Pack podcast, three years after I last spoke to him on the podcast, it is Nick Yaris. Nick, welcome back to the podcast. Wow, what a difference three years have made since we first did our first recording, brother. Yeah. Yeah, it's been Wow. In the span of time, that it took for me to explain to your audience my grasp of freedom and the basis of our speaking. I went through every type of turmoil you can imagine. I ended up losing my entire business because of COVID. In March of 2020, I was actually booked to go to Copenhagen to the Royal Ballet Theater. And I was so proud to be booked for five nights speaking, followed by a trip to London, to the School of Film in London, where my film, The Fear of 13, was actually made. All booked, all the proceeds ready to go into my pocket, everything paid for. I was so excited. Amnesty International was actually supporting my trip to Copenhagen and then COVID wiped out everything. Boom. So my wife, Laura and Bethany are, and Zara are two girls with a cat and three dogs, four dogs went and lived in the Siskiyou National Forest. And at first we were living in a borrowed camper and then I made it uh, a deal later on with a, a friend of mine, uh, author, who put up money to make a new documentary that's soon to be released this year called Life After. And he gave me enough money to buy a 1996 motorhome for me and my family to live in the woods out of and enough sustenance to hold us over. My wife was taking care of us at times, going into town to take, uh, and doing cleaning jobs. And she had feelings for one of her customers and decided to leave. I was left in the woods with just my dogs, my cat, and my RV. And I had just lost every single thing that was making me happy holding me together, you know. I ended up parked along the Pacific Ocean all of 2021. And it was towards September of that year that I had a crazy incident happen to me. I was parked along the ocean side when I met a shaman and the shaman was in training, but they were a person. And I was so amazed at what they were like able to bring out of them. So I ended up spending like three days camping next to this person 
who was on their way to South America to go visit all of these indigenous areas and perfect their craft of being a shaman. And one of the discussions we had was that we were talking about crystals and she said that crystals would always show me the way. And I, I never fell into any of that. I didn't really caught into the notion of the powers of minerals and such. So she parted ways and I went into a local town called Gold Beach, Oregon on the coast to get my supplies one day. And a woman behind the counter serving me told me a story about how at her other work in a restaurant, one of the customers had recently spit in her face for serving her food without wearing a mask. I couldn't believe that someone had done that to a server at a restaurant. So I told her, look, I'll tell you what, every time I come into this business, I'll be ultra polite to you. And hopefully it'll make it up to you for what that other person did to you by spitting in your face. And she said to me, you're such a polite person. You should come and work at my restaurant. We need someone to come and help. I don't know. I, I really didn't think much about it. And the oddity was, her name was Crystal. And she was a Southern girl from Virginia. Well, I went over and I interviewed and I got hired at the job. And I began cooking for people. And the first day of work, I came home. There was a white car parked next to me and I didn't think much of it, but I waited till the next day to see who the person would be camping next to me along the river at a section called Pistol River. There's a big wide pull off and you look out over the Pacific Ocean and it's just beautiful with these monolithic rocks sticking up out of the ocean. It's just picturesque. When I came home from work, I saw that the uh, camper in the car, a white vehicle, had a dog and when they got out of their vehicle, there was something wrong with his leg. So his dog and my two dogs that I had at the time ran off to the beach side and we soon followed in pursuit and began talking and greeting to one another. I, know, I learned that his name was Alex. And I would soon learn that Alex was a very, very special human being. Alex was diagnosed with a form of bone cancer that has killed every human being that has had it within six months of diagnosis. This man standing before me had had this cancer for nine years. I couldn't believe what he was telling me and how overwhelmed he felt that he was carrying such a huge burden inside. I smiled and let him get it all out of him. And when I sat down with him and served him some of the food that I brought home from the restaurant, we sat together by the ocean side and I told him my story. His eyes boggled. He couldn't believe that he was hearing a story that was equal in so many ways to the arduous journey he had been on. And he said to me at one point, Nick, I, I've always felt like I would never be able to tell my story to anyone without them either fleeing from me, feeling pity for me, or making me feel like it was a wasted effort until I sat next to you. From that day onward, Alex and I began becoming great friends while we camped together. We had a moment sitting together where the ocean surface before us was lit up so beautifully, not by the moon, but by the galaxies of stars in the Milky Way above us. The Milky Way itself aligned so perfectly as we sat there before the calm ocean waters that it looked like billions of candlelight was all over the surface. We couldn't believe we were witnessing this and we talked about how we were going to come back and hang out and see each other again in six months. Now, that's really important to Alex because every six months he goes for a checkup on his diagnosis. At first, he told me 
the heartbreaking stories of how they kept telling him it was 100% he was going to die. He couldn't even get that 1% offer of hope to him from doctors. When he first survived his first six months, he couldn't believe it. And when he first, when he first survived his first five, six months, he couldn't believe it. But then he started to believe it because Alex became ultra positive and he didn't want to have his cancer die with him. So he tried to figure out a way to love his cancer alive to the point that he could deal with it. Now, I don't know where he summoned the courage for all of this, but I knew I wanted to keep my promise to him. So we stayed in touch and we keep fervently sending messages back and forth to each other over the National Football League here in America. See, Alex, ironically, is from Virginia, the same area as Crystal. And just like the shaman said that Crystal would show me the way, this whole convoluted story started to give me all this empowerment. When Crystal found out that Alex was from her area, she said, of course he lived for nine years with this cancer. He's a strong boy. He's from Virginia. Alex drove 500 miles this April from Washington all the way down here to stay with me so that we could watch the NFL draft in April of 2022. I personally hadn't watched it since I was set free from death so I was eager to have this experience, but it was so gratifying that my friend made it another six months, you know? And he has all these clever inventions for him and his dog because one of the problems with the cancer was they had to cut his leg off, remove cancer from it, and then put it back on. It's in a precarious situation where if Alex falls over, they're going to have to amputate his leg. In a world full of violence, I taught him so many different ways to defend himself in cleverness because it gave him solitude from fear over here. And he told me that the only time he ever really truly felt alive, when he was in the United Kingdom, he visited Glasgow. And for some reason, Nothing mattered. The cancer didn't care. You know, he didn't have any cares at all. And he went and did a genealogy study of his blood and found out he has Scottish heritage. As we sat by this lake watching this program on my phone of the NFL draft, he told me of his dream to go back to Scotland. I didn't know how I was going to get him there. I have nothing. I lost everything. At the time that he came to visit me, I, I was making $860 a month working as a handyman. I don't have anything, you know? So I went and prayed about it. And then I met my friend David from Scotland. And he has a podcast called Development by David. And I told him about Alex and how it would just be so nice to have him on the ground if I could get Alex a ticket to go to Scotland. So he agreed back in April to help me with that idea. And then I saw that that was going to not really be it. So last week, as I told you, Lewis, I recorded the podcast with David hoping to attract some kind of help for Alex because his last diagnosis didn't go well. And despite his positivity over and over, I'm not waiting around to do this good. So I decided to fling all of my stuff to the side and to throw myself into this good that I have before me to try and help this amazing survivor of cancer have this moment of feeling truly alive again by visiting Scotland and having friends there to, that welcome him. If that's all I get to do this year, then it makes up for me almost dying in January from a car wreck or almost dying in February of blood poisoning or 
having lost my wife and children, having lost my business, it'll make it up for all of that. So that's why when I saw you on my radar again, Lewis, I said, yes, I know you're offering me help to get my books sold. I know you're going to try and help me because you're a good person. I don't have the courage anymore to ask for anything for myself. I don't want anything anymore. What I want is just to be a good person, doing something good for someone else without the burden of being poverty stricken, blocking me from being that. That's it. Like, I really get it. I thought so much about this. Ouch. That's going to be on a blooper reel somewhere. <laughs> okay, so think about this. I work right now in another kitchen. I make delicious food for other human beings. And I can't imagine how they would feel if they saw me wearing prison eyeglasses in an orange jumpsuit and shackles are on me. Like, they couldn't envision that person having prepared this delectable meal for them. I'm kind and polite to everyone because that's my freedom. I figured it out, Lewis. You know, it doesn't matter if you're stricken with cancer like Alex and you have this enormous burden. That boy has enough freedom to be, be kind and gentle to everyone never bitter about what he's not going to get or doesn't have he doesn't have someone to love him he's been on his own for nine years he hasn't had a woman in nine years to love him because when he was stricken with cancer she left his love and life is bishop this amazing dog I get it about Alex, man. The isolation didn't make him bitter. He chose the freedom of kindness. And that's what I figured out. You know, in the last six years, this is crazy. I went back since April and I started looking. I saved over five 600 of 560 people's lives of committing suicide like actual messages i had one woman write me who said i put on the television in the background i fed my cat for the last time and i was sat on my bed with a, a big glass of water and all of my pills around me to go to sleep for the last time. As I lay my head back on my pillow, I heard this voice and it was because inv inevitably and by mishap, the Netflix channel was playing on my television and a haunting voice called to me. I'm 68 years old, I'm stricken with, and she's told me all of her ailments, that she was overwhelmed, that she couldn't take it no more. There are so many like that. I, I mean, people who have been utterly destroyed trusted me to be gentle with their trauma. Then there was the hundreds upon hundreds of addictions and people who have been mentally warped from addiction or lost from their partner's addiction and all of this trauma. I've been the richest person in the abilities I've had to make a difference for people like Alex or David or you or myself. 
that I, I get it. The reason I had to be poverty stricken, the reason I had to have no trappings of wealth and luxury was so that I could go on the, the level of humanity that people would trust me with their trauma. That, that's fascinating to me. Like people are drawn to me because no matter what I go through or what's been taken from me or what is ever going to face me, I find within myself the glimmer of hope that they hold for who they are. That glimmer becomes magnified by my actions to them because they pray so hard. It's within them to be that in the moment. Now, if you could wrap your mind around that one thought, you can understand why so many people will really struggle to be free. Free of fear, free of care. Care, if you look up the definition of the word, is chaos. A state, a state of uneasiness. When you care too much, you'll give yourself an imbalance that will destroy your life. So you have to be free of that. Yeah. Well, this is why I think you were the, you know, the ideal guest for this podcast. I don't think anyone has a sort of license to, to talk on the subject of, of, of freedom quite like you. And, you know, we, we, we did that last time and this is what this show is about. This little ornament behind me here with this bird, with our logo on it is, you know, s symbolic of freedom. And you mentioned your story having such an impact on those people. And that is an absolutely beautiful thing. And, you know, when, when people think about your story, they think of all, all the hard times you went through. But to say now that that story has a, a positive impact, am I right in thinking that you wouldn't change anything about that? Pablo Picasso said the meaning of life is to find your gift. And that the purpose of your life was to give that gift away. My friend Jason Daly had that on his wall in his house. And ever since I read those words, my life was profoundly changed. I live such a purposeful life that I have profoundly given all of this gift away. And the only possible way I could give it away is to experience so much more than most people could ever imagine beyond what they know of me. As I sit here talking to you, I have a person determined in my life to destroy me. I can't help it. It's a psychological fixation that they have because of a disorder about being a stalker. But could you imagine that whatever personal experience I have already had or will have, this person will try to denigrate me. Now, the only way to free myself and find freedom from this attack is to deliberately treat myself like my best friend. So whenever I am aware of an effort to do something like that to me, that's the day I make sure to have a nice long bath. I shave, I have a nice meal, and I always have ice cream or other treats that I enjoy because that's what I would do for you, Lewis, if someone did that to you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that, that, is, that is a theme that you know we, we picked up on last time and, and, and you talked about how you developed this way to, to be nice to yourself, to love yourself whilst you were in, you know, whilst you were on death row. So what would your advice be to people on, on self-talk? Because you said, no, you know, no matter what you do to me, you'll never take away my kindness. You were essentially able to, to sort of reshape your neuroplasticity whilst you were on death row, just through self-talk. What advice could you give to right. people? So the number one fear that most people have is public speaking. And it's because they haven't mastered the ability to speak to themselves comfortably. I was blessed with a setting where I took everything off my walls except for a singular photograph of myself. And many people can do this just by putting the photograph that you love of yourself in the corner of your mirror. And I began to speak to myself, to encourage myself, because in life, you'll find out 
eventually, if invariably, you are your best friend, not someone else. We look to others for their strengths within us. That's why my mother had a great saying. She said, if you can show me your friends, I can tell you who you are. Invariably, we draw, we are drawn to others based on our character makeup. So singularly, it's hard to master. But once you get into it, if you think about it this way, neuroplasticity is the basis of erasing PTSD. What is neuroplasticity? It is the meticulous, polite behavior of speaking to each other, of listening to music while praying or playing with puppies or being in nature. These are things that remove the toxins left to you by PTSD. Your brain has a reward system set up in it so beautiful that if you go into a room and you try to be polite to another person, the feedback from that person can accelerate your own brain's reward system like Pavlov's dog, and it will supplant all memory of what your trauma was. I've gotten so good at this. I promise you, Lewis, this is strange. I recall death 21 years of solitary confinement like a movie I've watched too many times, but I don't really have any attachment to memory. I have to force myself to think about it. I don't live it. I don't drag it with me. I'm not consumed by it. I'm completely free of it because I work so hard at neuroplasticity healing. I'm all about today. I'm all about apps. I'm all about doing that next good thing because I've revamped every part of my brain. There was a, you mentioned um, your mother there and I remember you saying that uh, there was a quote that your mother said when you, when you first um, came out of, of what well, you were set free and she said, we're going to love you back to life. What did she mean by that? And what did that look like? Just like Alex, I was told 100% I had to have a liver transplant when I got out. People who don't know my story, I'll summarize in this way. At the age of 20 years old, I was a drunk, alcoholic, drug addict who badly abused the system, went to jail, falsely made up a story about a newspaper account of a murder, was then lied on by police, charged with this murder, convicted of this rape and murder, sentenced to die, and was put in solitary confinement for 23 years in Pennsylvania's death row. While I was there, I contracted hepatitis C from the beating that they gave me in which they broke my teeth and things like that, and the dentist infected me. I became so sick with this virus in my system, I asked to be executed in 2002. And in 2003, DNA's results finally granted to me, proved that I wasn't the person who committed the rape and murder. And then finally in 2004, two years after that effort started, I was set free. Upon release, I had such severe damage to my internal organs because I signed up for the interferon and ribavirin cancer-fighting drugs, they give hepatitis C victims, they used to, because in the Western philosophy, if you nearly kill the host, you can kill the virus. So they nearly killed me with these drugs. They blinded me for three days. So I asked to be executed, and that's how I got my DNA and got released. So my mother sat me down initially, and with a perplexed look like this didn't make sense to her, she said, this doesn't make sense, Nikki. You can't be serious. She said, I can only tell you this. The doctors know their books, but they don't know you. So we're going to just love you back to life. I'm going to feed you. And you're going to go exercise. And when you get tired, you come home to me and I'll feed you again. And we'll just break this cycle. The other thing that she empowered me with was this brilliant thing. She said, 
I need you to be a polite, respectful person to everyone so that you say yes, ma'am, and no, ma'am, yes, sir, and no, sir, and please and thank you, because I want you to show respect for what was done to this family, not just you. People who have self-respect will stand in line and be patient, and they'll say please and thank you. Don't ever let anyone steal your kindness. Do you understand me? She gave me not only my physical health back, but she gave me the keys to neuroplasticity healing because I then took it as a mantra from mom to go be polite, not knowing that it made me super powerful. I always equated my strength to my physiological side. I always felt like because at a young age, I was so gifted that I could outrun a helicopter in fear or whatever, but... The true power of me came when I became kind because it insulates me from hurt. You can't possibly say anything to my face to make me hurt you. You can't possibly say anything online about me to hurt me. You can't do anything to really get to me mentally because I like myself and I know who I am. And that's the simplest way to think about that, Lewis. Yeah, it's a very, very powerful message, and and you know I love that sort of philosophy that you, that your mother instilled in you, and and let's not forget that you know your mother went through all this with you. I mean, I, I remember seeing um the, the you know the, the videos and pictures of your of your mother compiling all the the articles and 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 searching for some evidence to set you free. She really put her heart and soul into this, and to see you come out she couldn't well she had to bring you back to life almost because of everything she went through she was really a, a, a guiding light for you throughout all those years i'm sure i showed her pictures of me standing in front of margaret thatcher's portrait while performing and then i had the honor of all honors see many years ago when i first got out i was in a movie called After Innocence on the Showtime Network here in America, in which like Barry Sheck and Peter Newfield, and TV personalities like Phil Donahue were in it. And I went to New York and I had my parents come to New York as a very special honor at the conclusion of the screening, having sat in the audience with my parents beside me and having them see me fight for the victim in this crime, Mrs. Craig, because that's what they encapsulated. I went up on stage and I gave one of my most beautiful speech. My mother, afterwards, she looked at me and she said, I always knew that was you up there. That's amazing. She saw within me something more powerful than I could ever imagine myself. Now you have to understand, after only 10 months of my release, I had orchestrated an economic embargo tour of Europe by myself with the help of University of Pennsylvania students and a abolitionist group in Pennsylvania. Imagine only 10 months out of a solitary confinement, level five maximum security prison cell, Kofi Annan, the UN Secretary General uh, at the time, witnessed my speech before a combined session of the lower house, walked up to me in front of witnesses and said, you are one of the most beautiful speakers I ever heard in my life. And I was only 10 months out of prison. I followed that up with a performance at the Colosseum in Rome in which 20,000 people saw me in a beautiful set of clothes walk onto the stage and be the embodiment, the epitome of what freedom was. Lewis, it was mind boggling that my mother empowered me so much that night by looking at me and telling me she recognized all that about me because ever since then, I've held my own no matter what 
in any form. Every Saturday, Cleopatra in full regalia would come backstage at the Globe Theater in London, where Shakespeare's originated from. And she would lead me by the hand out on stage after begging the audience who had just witnessed Titus Andronicus for three hours standing on their feet to please share in this special gift she had for them. And I became that gift for all these people right there because I was empowered with the knowledge that I had a gift that people needed as taught to me by the simplest of gifts of all, that I could achieve every bit of that because someone believed in me. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that connection, that promise to your mother is was probably the the sort of the highlight of of your entire story to me and there was one bit in particular that i thought was beautiful and it was that when you you were talking about when your mother um you know found the evidence that would prove your innocence and that evidence got destroyed in transport and to a not to you know to most people that would break their own spirit but i remember you saying i felt more sorry for my mother than for myself that the evidence to set me free got lost people used to ring her up in the middle of the night and tell her that she was a pig for being the mother of the murdering monster that i was mm. when she tried to visit me in prison at times they tried so hard to discourage her they would force her to strip search even though she was visiting me behind glass they put my mom through hell Imagine knowing that she had cooked a meal and served that meal to me at the time of the murder. There was no way you could convince this woman she had it wrong. So with an invincible, incredible courage, she stood by me and did all of this legal work with me and wrote letters to everyone it was her remembering and fighting for the possessions of our household that were taken by police that they had no right to take, that they found the killer's gloves hidden in a file marked Yaris. They found the victim's clothes with sperm on them marked Yaris, not Craig, not the woman's name. And it was only because of my mother's persistence in 1992 that we found the evidence that would later be used to prove my innocence. But it had to go through the trauma of being distorted and attempts to destroy it. I was the first man in America to seek DNA testing in February of 1988. There was no way you could have convinced me right then and there, it would take me 15 years to get that DNA testing done. I watched over a hundred men set free from either death row or prison before I got my shot. I was the 140th exoneree and the 13th person proven innocent from death row. I thought that was the biggest joke ever. Wow. And with that evidence and when it, you know, originally got destroyed, I'm not sure how it got destroyed. Maybe you can enlighten us, but how did you manage to, to, to stay resilient when almost at the time your last hope had been, been taken away, destroyed? What does that tell us about the, the human spirit in you to, cause that, that, that is something that would, would, would finish most people's hope off all right well i'm about to try to explain something that might break a lot of people out or give everyone comfort are you ready mm -hmm. i watched my dog blue be be born and then a few weeks later before his eyes opened up i watched this puppy have a dream in which his legs flailed and he imitated barking. 
this dog was having a dream before his eyes opened up. So it's not possible for him to have dreamed of any memory. He couldn't possibly be dreaming of a future because that's not real. The only thing that I, I caught at that moment was that's pot. The only thing that makes sense is what if, what if, as we know physics, this planet was hit so hard by that asteroid that killed all the dinosaurs that it pushed us back a half second in time. Now, on this planet, that's not. But in the size of the galaxies of the universe and everything else, which are even expanding at different rates, maybe, just maybe, what if we're a half second off and our lives are already over. So that puppy is dreaming of the past and Nostradama wasn't dreaming of the future. He was dreaming of the past because we're already gone. And if we're already gone, then the only duty I have left is to live my life based on one equation. E equals MC square. Energy never dies. Wherever my energy goes from within my body, I'm going to be so kind to it that I give it no damage. I distort it no further. Do no wrong to it in the hopes that it continues on in a better form than when it came to me. Maybe we're all gone, Lois. Maybe this is all over. That's why I had dreams of myself in prison on death row that came true. I wasn't dreaming of the future me and seeing myself in these future events that I would then experience because that happened. I dreamed of something that's already passed and I'm just fulfilling it. Mm -hmm. And as such, it's my duty to be humble because I've been set free from the torment of wonder. Yeah. Oh, I'm blown away by that, man. Like it just, it so changed me this last year. I am so unafraid of anything. Wow. It's already maybe possible that it's already passed us by. And as such, why not? Why not just be kind to ourselves for knowing? <sighs> and that kindness or that mindset just it seeps in, in, into a lot of the stuff you talk about. And there was this quote you said about, I think someone asked you about whether you, you hold grudges and, and you said, I don't, I don't forgive, I dismiss. And I thought that was incredible advice for, for everyone to sort of yeah. think about on an introspective way. What do you mean by that? I don't forgive, I dismiss. All right without being vulgar, if a mentally deranged person came up to you on the road and in a very obvious, mentally retarded fashion began heckling you mm. by saying, you're stupid. I hate mo making this mockery. I'm not mm. being insensitive. You wouldn't be offended by that. You could easily see this as a person who has a mental deformity and they're calling you stupid is such an obvious, not an insult you couldn't be possibly hurt with them you've dismissed them as being as being capable of getting to you right all right every day for about two years i had an officer come to work at 7 a.m get the food cart come to my cell spit in my tray open the wicker throw the food in slam the wicker door shut and i would say thank you officer daly you get it I was able to do this because I dismissed him from having any validity in my life because he obviously had a mental problem. One that didn't matter if it was justified or not, this person was never going to change. They were driven to be nasty and mean. So I dismissed them from my life and I moved on. Now that was one equation of it. If you have an involvement with someone in your life, and they've wronged you. Don't let them hide behind the guise of being family and get away with it. I've seen people tolerate things from family they would never imagine 
a stranger getting away with stealing money from them, humiliating them, betraying them, do any of those things. And yet they'll still bond with that person over the notion that their blood take beatings from them, take beatings from your partner, all that stuff, because you love them. No, 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 no. So, all right, look, if you do something that makes us separate or you've wronged me or whatever it is, you're dismissed. And by that, I swear to God, I don't spend time thinking about you. I don't dwell on you. I stop caring about you because caring about you caused me to nearly kill myself or hurt myself or degrade myself. Nope, you're dismissed. And by that, I free myself from having angst or driven notions of revenge or even wondering how I can get even with this person. All that's a waste of goddamn time because that person still owns you. Every, all right, think about this. Lewis, what do you think is the most precious possession that you own? Oh, um, I would have to say a passport document from my Polish grandfather um, that he used to come to the UK during the war. Okay, I have something more precious than that. You ready? Yeah. It's called it your anger mm. your anger can make you tear that document up your anger can make you throw away your whole life and end up in a cell next to me your anger is the most precious thing that you own and you are imprisoned by it every time you lose control of it. the only way you're ever going to get through this is learning that you have a guard against this called kindness you see i didn't figure this out until it really hit me i'm so kind to myself i'm not letting my anger ruin my life i'm so kind to me nick the person that i like respect i'm not letting my anger take everything from me again because i can still count to this moment everything i lost in my life when i got angry I'm not fool. Uh, no, no more fool for the anger. Yeah. And I. That nearly I, destroyed me. And Lewis, I swear to my mother, I used to beat my head on a wall, man. I was so angry. Just wham, wham, wham. You want to feel pain? Come on. Just getting ready for the next beating. Just getting ready for him to open the cell. Come on. You want some of this? Like, I was so. Oh my God. I was so ugly with anger that's all i knew and out of pity this guard that had been a guard for many years he said to me come on boy you're gonna just bust your head against that wall every day he was taking me back from triage to get my head patched up and a dude that had killed himself left books in his cell he said, you go in that cell, you get some of them books, and you're going to read them. Man, with my scrambled mind and my anger, at first, it was Headache City, boy. There was no way I was getting out of this cell using these books. I was too angry. Lewis, anybody that tells you that they're not angry doesn't get it. It's not about whether or not you're angry as you speak to another person. It's how good you are at controlling your anger in the moment. I lived in a society for many years where if I openly displayed anger, I got my face beat in by my tormentors. I wasn't allowed to express anger. I didn't have the right as a human being to look at my officer who spit in my food and say, hey, you dirty whatever, and that you shouldn't have whatever, because then he would just push the button and four or five of them would come in with clubs and beat me like they always did. Thank God they gave me a setting where I That's beautiful. 
beautiful because I mastered the art of freedom in a cell that drove them nuts. I circumnavigated the globe while on death row. That's how free I was. After the beating, after I couldn't look at myself for six to eight months, I had to learn to practice to love myself. But after that, I made up my mind. When Jackie left me, I sought pen pals all over the world and I mailed them my hair so that they would do me a favor and put my hair where they lived. That is awesome. I managed from my cell in death row to send my DNA all over the globe. And I managed to circumnavigate the globe while sitting on death row. Wow. That's powerful. And um, even in other ways, like you mentioned those, those books that you were left with, that must have you know, you didn't physically travel the world, but you must have gone to places that you'd never gone to before just by stumbling into these books that you didn't even choose. I got so good at it that, like, Kipling would take me to Kafiristan and I, I would be king. I knew once every bit of his writing. Such a brilliant writer. And then Elmore Leonard with his dialogue-driven stories, like... Uh, ombre or, or you know books like um, Majestic Mr. Majestic like great writing like oh man and to see these as films too is just hmm. unbelievable so I got the blessing of having this extraordinary gift given to me as a child of a, being able to daydream and I only use daydreaming because of the childhood trauma done to me when I was sexually assaulted at the age of seven. But it made me a fantastic daydreamer because I needed to escape reality. So I say to you, if you can will yourself to daydream, be it on a couch or on death row, you're an experiencing in that moment your own mind's freedom over anything around you to the point you could be anywhere in the world and be happy with a smile for the thoughts you gave yourself absolutely and this is something i think a lot of people just gravitate towards i myself i'm looking at my bookshelf here and, and i've got all different fantasy worlds i've got harry potter i've got lord of the rings and all these places that when i find myself at my lowest i turn to these books to take me to these realms and and live these other lives and just be joyous like that is such a beautiful thing oh it is nice lewis i know exactly what you mean i love it that when i get interrupted and i come back from the world and i, and I have to blink because <laughs> i was so gone yeah <laughs> Uh, James Clavell had, oh my gosh, so, uh, the, the long-winded writers, as they called them, was like James Clavell wrote Shogun and Noble House and all these wonderful, uh, like these are novel, 800-page novels, you know, James Mitchner's Hawaii, like you could really get, like I didn't care about how much time they were trying to steal from me. I was grateful I had so much time to go like the Odyssey and all these great books. I was like, oh my God, this week's going to be massive. I got all these new books, you know? I was such a geeky nerd on death row of learning. I mean, I studied psychology, law. I got other prisoners off death row. I wrote letters to their mothers. I wrote letters to their lawyers. I, I, I machinated the system around me to allow me to grow up and develop as a man. So much so that when I left there, I felt the distortion of having lost my stature within that building. Everybody counted on me to get the mayor, man. I got so many friends that needed me, so many people that needed someone strong to guide them. In 2020, I fulfilled a promise I made while on death row I drove across America and I went and got Walter Ogre off a of death row finally. I met this man in prison who had been convicted of murdering a small child and putting her in a TV box on the street corner. He was innocent. 
And I gave him my word in 1999 that I would help him. It was such a great thing to see me able to keep my promise to myself to be that kind of person. I don't know about anybody else that went back for others to the hell where they came from. But I respect anyone who's done that because I know the effort it takes to come back for someone when you say, no matter where you go on this planet, if you yell my name long enough and loud enough, I'll come for you. It's beautiful. It's beautiful. And um, just going back a little bit to, you know, we were talking about books there and how you studied subjects and you developed this, all these new skills whilst in a place that is designed to take the hope out of people. And, you know, once you were, you were given the sentence of death and I remember you turned, you turned, you put this spin on it that I, I couldn't believe. And you said that you were going to study the dictionary until you could give the best speech for your death penalty. Like that is wild and 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 what was that process like of studying the dictionary and trying to teach yourself this amazing language so you can speak so eloquently like what is the purpose behind that for you in the aftermath of being attacked as a child i developed aphasia aphasia affects the process of language and it's really strange for a person to have aphasia to be a really good reader because it causes dyslexia. So despite the fact that I read over 9,000 books before I stopped counting, like literally, I shouldn't have been able to do that mentally because aphasia blocks the process and retention of uh, memory from reading because reading is a artificial process we as humans develop. Language is an auditory process. That's why you still hear things while you're reading. <laughs> yeah, the mind is complex. So the, th the crazy thing about all this was the dictionary had to be able to give me enough words to search my mind for so that I can compose a death speech because they were going to put me to death. Now, I was only going to have a short amount of time to try and hold my shit together as a 20-year-old kid when they put me in the electric chair and then flipped the switch. So at first, I used to practice sitting upwards with my head up against the wall with my eyes closed and try and come up with something. It was so hard, Lewis. It was so terrifying. How am I going to tell people I forgive them for murdering me for something I didn't do and then tell them who I am all in a minute? Like, how am I going to do this? Like, it was driving me nuts. And it wasn't until I learned about neutrinos and how they pass through the earth and everything else because they're particles emanating from the sun and they don't have any boundaries. They pass through the, any hard surface you think. Diamonds, nothing stops this thing. And that Japanese scientist that hollowed out a, a mountain in Japan to study the rate of neutrinos that pass through the earth. When I found out about that, I began practicing my death speech because I had empowered myself at that point to overcome my speech impediment. And I had this beautiful speech ready for him, boy. It was all based on forgiving them for not knowing that I was as beautiful as the neutrino passing through the earth. And I could forgive them for their ignorance without having to do much more than explain in this beautiful, profound way my elevation to them by speaking to them in a manner they could have never fathomed themselves speak. But then came the torment of practicing his speech for 20 years. And then they kicked me off the stage and they took the microphone off my hands and they said I couldn't make the speech. So I went to the mountains and I practiced it one time, one time only. I drove this Jeep all the way up into the mountains and I got up on this giant boulder overlooking this mountain. 
and I practiced my speech one time perfectly, beautifully. And I burst out crying because I, I realized right at that moment, I would never be this free. I would never appreciate being this free because I just got out of prison. There's no way I could ever feel this way again. And I was heartbroken because I could never be as free as I was the day I gave my speech. Fascinating. Absolutely fascinating. Well, I, before we, you know, talk and let the listeners know where they can help your friend Alex, where they can, you know, look more into your work. I've got two final questions before we get into that. And the first one is, <laughs> if possible, if you can summarize it through all your experience, I know we've talked about it already, but I think as we start to wind down, it'd be nice to, to, to just recap after being set free after 22 years on death row, after everything you've gone through, what does the word freedom mean to Nick Yaris right now? The word freedom means the kindest possible you, despite whatever's been done to you. You want to let go, find the kindest part of you. You want to overcome it, find the kindest part of you. If you don't believe me, trust me when I tell you, every prison is full of people who regret not being kind. They'll tell you their story over and over and lament because they failed themselves in kindness. That is a beautiful way to put it. And in the same spirit, the last question that I ask every guest that comes on this show. For Nick Yaris right now, what makes life worth living? A young man last week trusted me not to kill himself. 17 years old, struggling with the distortion of the parents' guidance that's gone badly. Actually, was out on the roadside walking on the street telling me how he was thinking about stepping off into the traffic. The blessing and the gift that that young person gave me that day is the most precious gift anyone could give me. And I look forward to the next person and the next person and I will give and I will give because I have a purposeful life of giving the gift that I am like that to others. Just like Pablo said. <sighs> Want to know the crazy thing? Guess what his name was? What was that? Lewis. <laughs> wow. And, um, Hey, Lewis, if you're listening, man, thank you for believing in you. This has been a very emotional and, 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 and heavy and valuable, valuable discussion. And I know we started off this, this discussion talking about your friend Alex and, and what you want to do for him. Um, and if there's, is there any way that you would like to point these or this this audience right now who, who may want to help? Is there a fundraiser they can look to? Is there something online? I don't know what to do. I don't know what to do. Uh, Adam Manowski just built uh, a new website for me called NickYarrisOfficial.com. So I don't know what to do, Lewis. I'm trying to figure it out. I know that if you put it out there, it'll happen. My friend Alex lives in Gold Bar, Washington. I don't want a damn thing out of this. I'll set up a way for people to get in touch with Alex. He lives on his own with his dog, and he's a 
amazing human being that needs us to reward him. You know what his dream is? He came up with all of these inventions and he wants to give them life. And he also wants to write a book called the Human Owner's Manual hmm. about how to take care of yourself, despite cancer, whatever. That's that. the kind of person this is, man. So please, if you got it within you, just to reach out to him and make him feel good about his life. And that's all I'm asking for. Lewis, let people get in touch with you to need to get in touch with me. Yeah. You know me, brother. I always respond to you. We'll figure this out. It'll come about. I know it. The best way to always be on social media is just explicitly organic and honest. I met a friend. He's inspired me to be a better human being for the efforts of good I'm trying to come up with. Please help my friend Alex realize there's so much more to freedom than beyond the words that I could share with you or that Lewis could bring to you. That's all I could hope for. Well, I, I just want to encourage everyone listening or, or watching right now to 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 head over to your um, socials as well. And, and, you know, if anything does come up, is there any way they can they'll find that through your social. So look up Nick Yaris on Instagram and Nick Yaris official dot com and uh, keep your eyes peeled there. I think that would be the best place to direct people to. Man, I keep thinking about one thing, Lewis. Your grandfather was searching for freedom, man. And you are the epitome of his freedom. Mm. Your existence is his dream of freedom. Man. Freedom from the tyranny of others. I am so blessed to know you. I'm so honored. And I think it is so apropos. I helped three years ago get you going. Yeah. And here you are strong enough now to return the favor of getting me back going. That's some powerful shit. It only comes about because of kindness. Thank you for reaching out to me. Thank you to your audience for listening. And I hope that I've done a cogent job of speaking eloquently for myself and for my friend Alex and I wish you all the best absolutely brother look I, I'll, I'll never forget you you helping us out early on and, and I'll always be here um, for any any way I can help you and uh, assist you in any way I'm I'm always here for you brother so I appreciate you coming on today and um, we'll definitely stay in touch because you know, this, this is a connection that I value a lot. I appreciate you. I appreciate your story. I appreciate the value you've given me and my listeners. So thank you so much. And uh, I hope we get to speak again soon. We will. Stay in touch, Lewis. Much love to you and your family, sir. And to you, my friend. We'll speak soon.